All right, I think um, we'll make a start. I've noticed quite a few people have logged on. Uh, my name's um, Mark Leckie. I'm the, the current New South Wales um, president. This is a, a New South Wales meeting, inverted commas. Um, and our speaker tonight will be Peter Hadley. And I'm sure we can all read the, the title, but something to do with LIDAR mapping and something to do with the, the Blue Mountains. But uh, first I'd like to run through a few uh, housekeeping um, issues. So welcome to everyone. Um, New South Wales, Victoria are in the same time zone as me, but if you're from uh, somewhere else on the planet, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you actually are. Uh, first of all, we'd like to thank our, our corporate members. Um, our high size, Total Seismic, Fell Size, Southern Geoscience, Santos, Transparent Earth Geophysics, Doug. Um, they sponsor a lot of things to do with the society um, issues and uh, it's most most thankful that uh, they do this. Um, at a more local branch, um, this one, uh, local sponsors, New South Wales, it's GBG Australia. Thanks again to GBG Australia for sponsoring our meetings and for South Australia, Northern Territory and the WA, you can, you can see the, the relevant sponsors I have there. And we're all hoping that COVID issue finishes sometime and we're able to have face-to-face -face meetings. Um, uh, basically, if you want to ask questions of, of Peter's talk, um, type them in when you think of them or type them in at the end. The um, Q&A function uh, will do, also chat will do. I'll try and monitor both. Uh, type the questions in and, and I will read them out at the end so Peter can um, uh, mull over them. Uh, upcoming webinars, uh, 10th of November, is Richard Bartlett looking at um, uh, Pre-stack depth imaging in Brazil uh, on Wednesday the 11th, uh, the Inia Critic, and I'll do a quick advertisement for one that's not there, but the student night for the New South Wales is sometime in uh, November as well, where we have our honours and master students tell us what's going on. Um, please log on to these talks. Um, member benefits, I assume most of you are members, but if you're not, um, free access to exploration geophysics, our, our scientific journal, a free copy of Preview, our, our, our journal about what's happening, uh, reduced entry to conferences. Um, <laughs> it says free entry to regular technical events in your state. What it means is when COVID has calmed down, there'll be uh, tech event, technical events in your state that are not Zoom. Um, annual wine offer, uh, the one I like at the bottom is a free membership for students and half price for retirees. Um, it encourages students to network and interact with um, our full members. All right, so if you're not a member, please seriously think of um, joining up. Um, the conference next year in um, Brisbane, the AEGC, uh, 15th to the 20th of September, short abstract submissions are now open. I haven't read the fine detail, but I'm just gonna say 300 words or so, um, but uh, be selected to, to, to give a presentation then. You have uh, to the end of the month uh, to get your abstract in. So if you haven't already, um, please do so. Um, keep in touch, um, although depending on where you are, um, uh, email newsletters, the website, um, Facebook, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, and all these talks that uh, happen uh, are YouTube, and you can go back and, and revisit all, all the, the speakers, some that you've missed and some that you want to clarify of what's going on. Right, I will let um, uh, Peter settle on. But Peter Hadley has been in industry for quite a while. I noticed in his short bio, he said he worked at CSIRO, uh, the Geological Survey of New South Wales, uh, the University of Sydney, and I'm sure there's a few more uh, in there. Um, when I first met him, he was uh, into seismics, but he's uh, ventured out into many different things. Um, and he's done something that I plan to do very soon, which is to take a great interest in his local area. So without further ado, all yours are Peter, you can do a better introduction than that. Thank you, Mark. Um, is that working? Uh, no, not yet. Okay. Uh, you should share the screen, should just show you. So it's just the same green button. Peter, that I thought that's what I'd pressed. And then it will give you the option of which screen to share. 
Share screen. I'm pressing a green share screen button. And, and this is, oh, so okay, and press that share. Is that working now? Yep, that's working now. Thank you. All right, so it's over to me. Good. Well, thanks for the introduction, Mark. Um, my talk contains just 27 slides and I'll be giving you a bit of a free ranging introduction to the geology and geophysics of the lapsed and structural complex. Abbreviated to the LSC, this geological structure lies about 50 kilometres to the west of Sydney, and it forms an abrupt escarpment rising up to 600 metres above the Cumberland Plain, which is to the east. The LSC marks the eastern boundary of the Blue Mountains, and until 1813, the mountains formed a barrier to the westward expansion of the early colony of New South Wales. The LSC is a series of north-south trending monoclines and faults, which extend, which extend about 100 kilometres. Its position is easily seen on satellite images because it marks the transition between the fertile soils on the Cumberland Plain in the east and the poor sandy soils derived from the outcropping Hawkesbury sandstone in the Blue Mountains. Early European settlers cleared the fertile land for agriculture and left the Blue Mountains in their natural bushy state. This is still the situation. So we have the LSC coming down through this, um, this area, area here. All this dark green area is, is, the, um, is, is the natural bushlands. Much of it was burnt in the um, bushfires of earlier this year and late last year. The LSC is the dominant geological structure of the Sydney region. And its significance was recognized by the early geologists. Edgeworth David, for instance, described it in 1902 and thus discussed aspects of its formation. Um, what I'm particularly interested in is the LSC. We have here a monocline and a fault, and that was mapped in 1902 by Edgeworth David. In a bit more detail, the eastern front of the LS LSC is a monocline in the northern parts and a fault in the, and a fault in the south. Where it is a monocline, it is accompanied by a non echelon fault system immediately to the west. These faults are downthrown to the west. So here we have the monocline coming through here. It's a monocline all the way to about here. And then it starts as a fault and it continues on further to the south for a total distance of about 100 kilometres. The downthrown um, faults to the west in, on, in the on echelon pattern are these dashed lines coming coming through here. Another feature of the ELSC is the unusual course followed by the rivers in the region. For example, the Nepean River flies, flows twice into the high ground of the LSC, only to exit again a few kilometres downstream. Other rivers such as the Gross River and Glenbrook Creek flow from the west and straight to the ele elevated ground of the LSC. So here we have the Nepean River coming through, enters the um, the LSC in the Blue Mountains at Bent's Basin comes back out onto the Cumberland Plain, goes back into the mountains at uh, what's called Norton's Basin and through the LSC, comes back out near Glenbrook Creek and that's in the vicinity of Penrith and then the, the river continues through there. The Gross River and Glenbrook Creek, which I just mentioned, that's Glenbrook Creek coming through there, it flows from the west and goes straight through the LSC, the elevated ground which is here and similarly for the Gross River, which is flowing from the west to the east over here. These two profiles, AA prime and B, B prime are shown over here. And you get the sense that the, um, the high ground to the west, the escarpment of the faults, and then the, um, the monocline to the east, that's for AA prime, and B, B prime, similar sort of situation, except in this case, the um, profile crosses the gorge of the Nepean River. So the Nepean River comes through here in this deep gorge, but you can see the fault here and the monocline system to the right. This slide shows the Gross River and the Peen River um, gorges where they pass through the western fault scarps and the elevated ground of the LSC. So this is the Gross River in the top, to the west, the east, the river's flowing from the west to the east, comes through 
elevated ground. We've got the fault scarps here and the monocline over here the Mon and the Cumberland Plain. In the case of the Nepean River, I'm looking down, looking along the course of the river, which is flowing into the, um, into the screen. We have the high ground of the LSC to either sides of the gorge and the rivers clearly flowed from this um, area in the foreground into the high ground and then out onto the Cumberland Plain, which is beyond the, um, the, um, the, the photo. Geomorphologists have proposed two main scenarios for the development of transverse drainage such as this. In the first, erosion from pre-existing river, a pre-existing river is able to match the rate of uplift of a de developing structure. For example, there are a number of antecedent rivers crossing the high Himalayas in Nepal. In the second scenario, an old structure lies buried beneath a cover mass. Erosion gradually removes the cover mass, and as this occurs, the river progressively erodes, erodes into the structure. Of antecedents, the first system, we have an old, we have an old river system, and then a, a, new, a new uplift. And as this uplift occurs, the river is erosion from the river is able to maintain uh, the river course through the, um, the elevating ground. In the second case, we have an old structure which is buried by a cover mass. The cover mass is eroded in a way, and as the erosion pr um, proceeds, the uh, old structure is, is exposed and the river starts to entrench its gorge through, the, um, the, through that bedrock high. There are published papers on the LSC which argue for both of these scenarios. An important implication is that if the rivers are antecedent, the LSC can be relatively young. I'm talking in geological terms. If you want to argue for an old LSC, you have to invoke this, the, um, the superimposition model. <clears throat> For a number of reasons, I regard the river systems as being antecedent. One of the reasons is that the LSC is just one of a number of abrupt north-south trending structures in eastern New South Wales. Some of these have been interpreted to be neotectonic. The most notable is the Lake George Fault adjacent to the Federal Highway to the north of Canberra. In the Geoscience Australia database, the LSC is characterised as being a probable neotectonic feature. So here we have the Lake George Fault coming through here, Lake George, Canberra and Sydney. And here are the north-south trending um, structures of the, um, of the LSC just to the west of Sydney. As I say, Geoscience Australia have um, classified or characterised most of the LSC as being a probable neotectonic feature. The driver for these neotectonic features is thought to be the dominant horizontal compressive stress in southeastern Australia. This has mainly a west northwest orientation, which is interpreted to be due to compression generated at the plate boundary over in New Zealand. This compression is thought to have existed for about the past 10 million years. So if the LSC is due to compression and given the geological sequence of hard and soft layers within the Sydney basin, there are a number of scenarios which allow this structure to develop. At the simplest level, the sequence consists of a strong sandstone layers consisting of the Hawkesbury sandstone and the Narrabeen group, which overlie weak coal measure, a weak coal measure sequence, which overlies a, a marine siltstone, which is also weak. And then we have a strong basin, um, basement strata. So um, two, two faults are shown here, the fault propagation fold and the blind base, basement thrust. Both of those could be uh, scenar provide scenarios for the development of, a, um, of an LSC structure with a compressive stress field. Across the LSC, uh, some, of, um, some relatively modern seismic reflection data have been shot for oil and gas exploration. These are data from 1988 to 1987. As you'll see, the seismic data has its problems when shot directly onto the Hawkesbury sandstone. I'm going to show you the um, sections for this northern northern line, CD88214, coming through here, and CD87115 coming through down here. Uh, you might recall there was Norton's Basin on my earlier map, which is where the Nepean River comes. There's Bent's Basin here, the Nepean River is on the Cumberland Plain, flows north, then takes an abrupt uh, westward turn 
and flows into the um, into the LSC where it joins the Warragamba River and continues on um, on its northward course. So, just with the uh, southern line, CD eighty seven one one five. Most of the source and receiver points were on outcropping Wainamata Shale. We can see the Hawkesbury sandstone sequence and the start of the coal measures with the Bull I seam. Here, the LSC is re represented by the steep west dipping thrust of the Nepean Fault. As is often the case in the city base, and the strength of the reflections from the coal measures prevents the imaging of the fault behaviour at deeper levels and the, also the imaging of the basement, which is at a depth of a few kilometres. Anyway, it's quite clear that we have a fault coming through here. The throw in that is 100 metres or so, top of Hawkesbury, base of Hawkesbury, Narrabeen group, well, I seam, and then we go into the coal measures and the underlying siltstones. On the more northern line, we have a, um, a sadder story from the seismic data because it's only in the eastern side that the, um, the line was shot on the Wainamata Shale, and we have good quality. Um, resolution of the top of the Hawkesbury base of Hawkesbury Bull I seam. And we also get a sense of the, um, of, of the monocline being present in this, on this line and not the um, reversed, um, not the, threat, the, the reverse fault shown on the previous um, section. Sadly, over in this area here, the line was shot over Hawkesbury sandstone and uh, oh, there, there must be issues to do with the, um, with, with the way energy gets introduced into the ground uh, on shooting on the sandstone, which just makes um, seismic recording, recording always difficult when you're shooting on the Hawkesbury sandstone. Uh, I now want to be a bit more geomorphological in what I had to say. And I admit that this is a bit of a dangerous thing for a geophysicist to do, but I will still persist. I've already mentioned that the Gross River flows through the LSC onto the Cumberland Plain and onto the Cumberland Plain in the east. This is another photo of that gorge of the Gross River looking from the west. The face of the hillside to the right over here marks the west facing fault. And I want to draw your attention to this uh, dip in the hillside up in here, which I'll show in the next few slides as being um, due to a stranded river valley. Um, just as an aside, in February, we had a significant rain event and the Gross River had a huge flood through it. You get a sense of the um, height of the flood where the vegetation has been cleared way down here on the um, lower left of the slide. So here's a, um, a topographic map of the, um, of, the, of, the, of the Gross River area. And this topography has been uh, produced uh, using LIDAR data produced by the New South Wales government's LIDAR mapping project. Uh, LIDAR data is available for all of the Blue Mountains area and is available on either a one metre grid or a two metre grid. And I'm using the program Surfer, which I think many people will be familiar with, to produce very detailed maps of the area. The shadowing here reflects the um, or highlights the topographic gradient. The stream systems are very evident. We can see that the saddle I'm interested in, the saddle that I'm interested in, which is shown by the red arrow here, appears to be connected to a stream system running down through, down through here. So I, I'm quite happy to, um, to, I direct, to um, interpret that saddle, which we saw in the photograph looking from the west. I'm happy to interpret that as being a truncated river system caused or created by, by uplift along the, um, along the fault system here and the monocline to the, to the east. Here's a um, 3D perspective of the same, um, same region, again, um, created using the LIDAR data. And the truncated river system is very plain, plain to see coming through here, perched high up above the, um, the, the current growth through the system, which, was, which is way down here. To me, this sort of behavior is best explained by a relatively young LSC uplift in probably in the last 10 million years and with antecedent rivers. Another piece for the puzzle comes from the deposits of semi-consolidated to loose gravels, known as the Rickaby's Creek gravel, which occur at the ground surface along the crest of the LSC and in the vicinity of the Nepean River, also out onto the Cumberland Plain. So the Rickaby's Creek gravel 
when it's up on the crest of the LEC, it looks something like this or something like this over here. And you can note that it's really close to the edge of quite precipitous gorges. This is the, um, the Peen River down in here. At the end of the um, century, um, end of the 19th century, Edgeworth David argued that the existence of these gravels implied antecedent river behaviour. In my own explorations of the area, I've found previously undocumented deposits of, on the west side of the um, Glenbrook Fault. If these gravels are, are to be seen as being contemporaneous with the gravels on the crest of the LSC, the gravels must pre predate the uplift and the an antecedent river system must be present. So the gravels I've recently located are here, here and here. And you can see that this is at a lower level to gravels which are present over here and here and here, which are on the high ground of the LSC and beyond the west facing Glenbrook Fort. On the east side of the LSC, I've also undertaken more detailed mapping of the gravels. And I've found that with, when combined with the LIDAR mapping, there's a clear suggestion that a widening gravel deposit from the Palo Nepean River has been uplifted by the formation of the LSC. So the dashed red line here indicates the envelope of where gravels uh, are found and can be expected to uh, have, have been present. There's quite extensive gravels on the eastern side of the LSC. But we can see how this broad area has now been uplifted and stranded by the, um, by, by, by the LSC. So some conclusions on this LSC. I'm proposing that there has been significant movement on this um, structure in the past 10 million years. That's, that's the period that we've had the dominant compressive stress coming from New Zealand. And that also that the major rivers are showing antecedent behavior, i.e. they are much older than the 10 million years of the, um, of the, um, of the uplift. I've argued this on the basis of the position of the Rickaby's Creek gravel, the existence of stranded streams. I've shown you how there are other north-south trending near tectonic structures in East and New South Wales. We have a favourable east-west horizontal compressive stress field. There are other factors which uh, contribute to this argument, but I'm not discussing them here. And that includes the low, low level of seismicity in the southeastern highlands of New South Wales. Longitudinal river profiles um, show the variations in river gradient within the Blue Mountains and the Epson structural complex. And also the topography in the vicinity of Miocene basalts, which lie to the west of the LSC within the um, high blue mountains. I now want to um, go to the southern end of the LSC, where there's a very interesting landform known as the Thirlmere Lakes. In this sharp oxbow bend in the valley, just in here, this is the LSC coming down here, past Penrith, we've been talking about areas up in here. I'm now coming down to this southern area. Anyway, in this sharp oxbow bend there, we have a, a valley which has six lakes lying above a sequence of um, sands and peats. The lakes get very little inflow, but the actual valley they lie in continues to both the north and to the, um, and to the west. So we have the valley here with not much inflow into it, but streams flowing uh, with, with a high height, the saddle here streams flowing to the um, north. And then over on this side, there's a, high, there's a saddle in the valley here. And there's a watershed which directs the water down this, this stream system here. We can notice how, how broad this valley is all the way through here. So there's a clear sense that there's been some sort of um, river system flowing through here. And then the part of it has been stranded by um, this is what I'm interested in, has part of it been stranded by the uplifts of the LSC. We have faults over here, monoclines coming through here, another mon monocline coming through there. So I'm, I'm, as I say, I'm very interested in seeing whether, I'm trying to work out whether this lake reps another system modified and stranded by the uplift of the LSC. Here's just a couple of photos of the, um, of the general area. This is one of the lakes. We can see the broad river valley I've been describing to you and a lake, there's another lake just beyond it. And if you go uh, to the west into what's called Blue Gum Creek, uh, this is looking up Blue Gum Creek towards the lakes, which are just around this corner here. Uh, Blue Gum Creek in this area is very small, but it lies within this very broad um, valley downstream of the lakes. 
of more topical interest to um, uh, people more generally is a significant drying event which has occurred in about 15 years ago in the Theromere Lakes. At this time, the lakes completely dried up for the first time in living memory. Since then, the lakes have partially refilled, dried out again at the peak of last year's drought, and they're now partially full again following the rains of this year. Given the significance of the lakes to the local community and their ecological importance as part of the Blue Mountains World Heritage Area, there have been calls for an investigation into the dynamics of the lakes and whether human activity has had a, any um, impact on the, um, on, the, on the water balance. I'm pleased to say that the politicians have acted. A few years ago, a research program was initiated by the New South Wales government with funding going to these organisations. Uh, ANSTO, University of New South Wales and the um, University of Wollongong. I've had the opportunity to assist with a shallow seismic refraction survey aimed at determining depths to bedrock within the lake system. I'm reasonably happy with the seismic refraction results we've obtained at the Nithilmi Lakes. On this line, which crossed the valley, it seems that the basal refractor is no more than 15 metres below the ground surface and is largely flat lying. One surprising thing is, is that although, um, oh, sorry, one surprising thing about it though, is that over much of the line, the refractor has a P wave velocity of just 2000 meters per second. This seems low, but it is consistent with the velocity we obtained from a calibration survey we undertook across a near surface Hawkesbury sandstone outcrop on the nearby ridge top. Drilling and age dating of sediment cores is currently underway. I look forward to reconciling these matters. Just to show you how that seismic refraction interpretation fits in with the, um, with the total um, topographic pro profile across the Theromere Lakes, we can see that the um, refractor uh, levels, of the, the layers within the, from the seismic refraction survey are really reflecting the, um, the, the basal structure of the, um, of the present topography and suggests that we have a old uh, mature river valley. And, uh, and if that's the case, we can get, uh, think about it as being a valley which has been trunked, truncated by the uplift of the LSC. It's a very similar situation to where, what I was describing at the, um, at the Gross River. But for, the, um, for those who wanted to hear a little bit more about, about some geophysics, um, as part of my work on the um, seismic refraction survey. I, I, I was interested, no, I haven't done seismic refraction surveys for um, decades. And that's what I was doing in my very first job back in the, um, in the 1970s. And I went online looking for um, modeling software, which I thought might be available free online to allow me to compare my interpretations, uh, compare um, calculated travel times for my interpretations with those observed from the survey. Anyway, I couldn't find anything, so I thought, okay, I'll have a go at trying to write my own little piece of software to do this. And I, um, I came up with this um, simple scheme, which I've written in, in, a, uh, in VBI, VBA within Excel. Um, in this um, uh, scheme, I can calculate travel times for an arbitrary velocity model by utilizing Huygens' principle to construct um, wavefronts. This forward modeling program allows comparison between observed travel times and those calculated for an interpreted depth section. So for each point on the 2D grid defining the velocity model, the program calculates travel times to that point, and I'm talking about using this one as my example. Um, we can calculate travel times at that point by taking the travel times to the eight points above and to the left of it, I'm proceeding from a source on the left, proceeding column-wise across, um, across the grid. If I look at the travel times to each of those points and then establish the, uh, the travel time from the points to the, um, the point of interest, I'm looking for the um, minimum travel time from each of those points to that point there, and that becomes a travel time to that point to, um, to take forwards to the, the ongoing calculation. This grid method, um, the program worked pretty pretty quickly, but it, it is only an approximation to, um, to what Huygens' principle would really require. 
but um, my comparisons with exact results for multiple dipping layers shows that my approach gives a reasonable approximation to, um, to the um, exact solutions. So here in this slide, I have a comparison between my calculated and observed um, travel time. So part of that line I previously showed you. The orange points are the observed travel times and the blue are the um, travel times I calculated for each of the shots um, using, using my Excel VBA program. Uh, the wave fronts that I'm showing you here are from a shot over here at, um, at this point here. And what you can see, you can see there's a direct wave spreading out through here. You can see refractions coming down through the underlying layers. You can see the spreading refractions. Um, and then you can see the head waves coming back up from the basal refractor, refractor and also the head waves coming back up from the, um, from the intermediate layer, up traveling back up to the ground surface and, and, the, and the landing at the geophones all, all the way along. So the match is not exact. And I, um, what I have to do is I have to try and marry the, um, the comparison of the calculated and observed for each of the, each of the shot points and uh, reconcile it with my, um, my velocity model. But I, I, I think that's close enough to indicate that uh, the interpretation that I've come up with does represent a reasonable um, assessment of an interpretation which can be made from these um, travel time data. Anyway, so this is um, the end of my um, presentation. So for my um, concluding remarks, I'd like to say that the Lapson Structural Complex west of Sydney provides an interesting intersection of issues relating to structural geology, geomorphological development, and neotectonics. There are lots of opportunities for geophysical techniques to help in a number of ways. Um, there can be, you know, there's ongoing earthquake monitoring obviously going on. Uh, aimed at determining the seismicity throughout throughout Australia, and obviously activity on the LSC is something which is, is of some interest. Uh, reflection seismic mapping uh, would uh, allows us to map map the structures and um, uh, investigate the layering. Um, the near surface geophysical investigations, such as ones I described at Kilmi Lakes, allow key sites to be investigated. At this point, I'd also, I guess I'd also Put in a plug for some airborne geophysics because that'd be really helpful in, in this sort of investigation. But sadly, this sort of area is um, largely over heavily built up areas and also over a very large national park. And the government agencies uh, don't tend to see value in conducting surveys over these sorts of um, areas. So we're not going to be seeing airborne geophysics of, um, of modern caliber being conducted for quite some time. Uh, Thirdly, um, the LIDAR data, um, that just provides a superb opportunity for studying landforms and investigating interact, uh, no, the interaction of the landform with the, um, what we know about the geology. And, uh, and here, here we are just 50 kilometres west of Sydney, and I'm seeing that there's just plenty of opportunities for geological investigation right on the doorstep of Australia's largest city. And here, yeah, just as my um, final slide, um, I've always been intrigued by the by the weather maps we see on the on the telly in Sydney. We always see the LSC standing up as the as the um, as the boundary between the Cumberland Plain and the, and the Blue Mountains. It never gets discussed, but uh, now we know a bit more about it. I hope you all see weather maps like this and think, gee whiz, I wonder what it really is all about. Anyway, that's my talk. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Peter. Okay, do I stop share? I know you can uh, keep sharing. I shall read out some questions. So if, if people have um, questions, please um, type them in and I shall look at the list. What have we got? All right, an ad. Uh, this is from uh, David Allen. The Goulburn River at Ulan also crosses mountains twice. Uh, I thought this was to do with volcanism of the cooler tops, but perhaps also with what you discuss. Um, comments? Um, yeah, yeah, that's a, um, I, I'm not familiar with the, exactly what goes on with the Goulburn River, but, uh, but clearly um, the behaviour you're describing, um, 
it can be interpreted as, as antecedent behavior. There's there's lots of antecedent behavior right through the, um, the, you know, the the region of the Great Dividing Range and, and the highlands of eastern Australia. So it don't, wouldn't surprise me if that's what the Goulburn River is doing. But um, but, but the basalts can also um, dam those rivers and uh, and force the rivers to create you know, alternate stream um, courses as well. So I'd, we'd have to look into it, but it's a good comment. All right, and David uh, follows up with, can you explain why the Kylo River cuts through the mountains from the west? Well, the Kylo River, in, in my way of thinking, uh, for those people who don't, don't know the geography of, of, of the region, the Kylo River come, joins the Nepean River slightly to the north of where the Gross River that come, comes through. And the Kola River basically um, cuts through the LSC right at its um, northern extent. Um, the thing about the Kola River is it's just a larger version of the, um, of the Gross River. And it's been eroding back through the mountains at a more vigorous rate than, the, um, than, than things like the Gross River. But if you were to look at the, um, the topography around the head of the Gross River, topography around the head of the Walgan River, which is a similar sized river, you can see that those river systems are just about to break through the, um, through the sandstones of the high Blue Mountains and enter the coal measure strata, which is cropping out to the west, just as it does in the, um, in the Colo, in, 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 with the Colo and Kapiti River Valley systems, which are, which are to the north. So uh, I just see that behavior as a, as a, as a, a similar behavior to what, we, um, what I'm seeing in these other river systems. Uh, thanks, Peter. Um, Todd Majeski says, very cool talk. What are the next steps planned to analyze our dry lakes? Ah, okay. So the project that's underway there, uh, I'm not at liberty and, and I, I don't have enough knowledge about it, but there's, there's been just so much age dating done on, um, on the cores which have been extracted from the lake. There's been shallow coring through the peats and the sands. Uh, carbon dating, OSL, cosmogenics, um, and not, lots of um, dating techniques have been thrown at it. As well, uh, organisations such as Vansta have been looking at the way the, um, the, the waters have flown into the lakes, where, where they, they can tell whether the inflow into the lakes is from um, recent rainfall or is coming out of the groundwaters. And I think the realised is that the lakes are actually very much um, film topped up by by rainfall in the um, in the immediate um, in the immediate catchment, which is which is not very much, and so um, so um, the, the the report which will come through, uh, bringing together all the factors at play, will be um, will be drawing on on these um, these various um, findings on the on on the the signatures in in the sediments and and in the water um and, and no, no, you know something else which is really interesting about all of this is that the lakes it appears that the lakes are actually providing a um an indication of climate through the um through the pleistocene so some of the um some of the material that's being um, taken out of the out of the deeper cores is is hundreds of thousands of years in age and so we are actually seeing um, um, sediments and material which has been accumulating in uh, through um, previous interglacials and perhaps being scoured out through um, um, through glacial intervals when we have drier drier conditions and, um, and the vegetation dries out. So there's a very important environmental proxy to be um, be obtained from the study of the of the Thielmere Lakes, and that's that's. Um, that, that'll be coming out into the literature in the um, in the in the in the next couple of years, I'd imagine. Uh, thanks, Peter. Um, Rob Houston says, are there any problems with the dis distinguishing the DEM versus the digital terrain model, e.g., treetop canopy elevation versus ground-based LIDO returns for producing accurate geomorph landforms? Um, yeah, that's a good a good question, and and um, the I'm really amazed at how well the, the LIDAR does pick up um, 
of the ground surface. Um, I'm not familiar with the total um, uh, procedure which is followed in, 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 in establishing which of the, um, the laser returns are those from the, um, from, from the ground surface. But online with, with the, um, the LiDAR data that you can download for free, you can also get the point cloud data for, um, for all of these areas. The files are much larger, but the point cloud data actually does give you the, um, does give you the vegetation. And if you compare the point cloud data to the um, to what's seen as being the topographic LIDAR, LIDAR you can see that there's a um, um, that the topographic LIDAR is, is 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 does represent the basal surface of the um, point clouds. Um, I've also done things like um, compare the LIDAR results to the um, to to the topographic um, contours from the existing. Um, one to twenty-five thousand sheets, and uh, it's a pretty, pretty good um, all up. I'm, 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 I'm reasonably happy. I'm pretty happy. I'm very happy with, uh, with with what we can do with the lidar. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Roger Henderson asks, can you explain again the purpose of calculating travel times? Okay, that's just a um, an exercise in forward modelling. I have an interpretation, um, uh, which is which is a, in, in the case of seismic refraction is a is a forward process. We have the travel times and we infer a um, a um, subsurface layering. But uh, un unless you have some way of calculating travel times, you have no way of closing the loop and, and, and establishing whether the, um, um, the, the the interpreted depth section you come from the seismic refraction. Does actually give rise to um, travel times, which um, which match the um, which match those as, that you observe. Um, if you really wanted to close the loop, you'd be putting in an inversion process, which would then allow which would allow you to sort of modify the interpreted section until the observed um, until the calculated travel times match the observed. But that's um, uh, that's not a job for this um, grey duck. But uh, something that's um, seismic refraction could well do with some sort of real inversion process. Uh, Ted Tyne says, excellent presentation, Peter. Great to see a practical integration of modern near surface geophysics to understanding of a long standing geomorphological question. So well done there. Yeah. Um, if anyone has another question, please type quickly. I'll sneak in um, my question. Um, how much um, uh, seismic data do I need to use your um, uh, little program? Is it work on a single line or do you need multiple lines? No, Mark, it just, it just calculates some um, travel times for a single shot point. So if you, if you know what your subsurface might look like, or, you don't, or you're just doing a theoretical study, you can set up your subsurface and calculate travel times for that, uh, for that model. Um, there is there's no need to have comprehensive survey data to, um, to do the forward modeling. All right, that's good to know, yeah, that's a, thank you. It's a handy little piece of code and uh, it's, it's easy to use. The key to everything. Um, Koya says, thank you, Peter. It, it, it is very interesting. And if I dart back to the other side, uh, Mehdi says, uh, I can do FWI on some selected seismic lines near surface to help your research. Uh, I'm not clear what FWI is. That'd be full waveform inversion, I think. Good. <laughs> so, so, so what's the comment again? It, it just says I can do FWI on some selected seismic lines near surface to help your research. So he's volunteering okay. to assist. Okay, okay. So if I could um, forward some recorded um, Seismic traces for for a selected shot. Um, the full waveform version would actually uh, do exactly what I was talking to Roger about. Would allow me to um, come up with a model for that uh, that shot, which match which uh, gives travel times matching the observed. Good, thank you. Uh, Millivan says, "Nice study, Peter. Regards for Millivan." So another compliment. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, uh, Millivan. Look at. Oh, you know, as most people know, I'm probably I'm not in, 
I'm not really doing exploration geophysics anymore these days, but I, I still like thinking about things and uh, I have the opportunity to work on problems like this and put in the bushwalking and that sort of thing. You know, it's a, um, I'm, ha I'm having great fun pursuing this, um, this, this type of research. Thank you. All right, well, I can't see any more questions. So on behalf of everyone, um, thank you, Peter, for a very interesting talk. Uh, it's got the, uh, the juices going for the Blue Mountains and there were some very interesting places you were wandering around and looking for your gravels. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mark. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you all. Yeah, for everyone uh, listening, Peter's talk will be um, recorded and put up on the ASCG website for later perusal. Thank you all. <laughs>